If you're a kid, you can go now. All right, good. I see more people getting up who are not kids. Wait a minute. You think you're kids, right? You want to be a kid. Okay, well, uh, it's nice to have you all here. And uh, we'll be here for the next hour or so. So if you have something to do, I hope this is it. Uh, We're going to go through a little bit more of this acronym, LEAVES. And um, I almost typed that as my password, LEAVES. That's not my password. That's what I was thinking about. Obviously, I'm a man. I can't talk about one thing and think about another at the same time. Okay, before we do, always want to have an opportunity to get in fellowship with the Lord, right? Fellowship's a basic doctrine of sanctification, so it's involved with our Christian growth, our spiritual life. And uh, you don't have to confess your sins to go to heaven, but you, do have, you just have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for that, right? Almost 200 verses, 198 verses in the Bible teach that it's either faith or belief, which are the same thing, um, in the Lord Jesus Christ is all that's necessary to be saved, that is to have a relationship with God. Uh, but once we are saved, then the issue is the, the walk, the fellowship with the Lord that we have in our spiritual growth. So one of the aspects is that we need to confess any known sin when we know that. Of course, when it came to David's attention in the Old Testament, Nathan brought it to his attention. What did he do? He, he confessed. Right? Psalm 51 is, a, is an inspired uh, section of Scripture that records his confession. And uh, we need to confess too, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this is just part of our daily walk, this cleansing that we need so we have a close fellowship with Him. So let's have an opportunity for that. And then we'll go through a lot of passages. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. It's one more day in your world, inside your plan. And we have a purpose because we've been saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ so that we can now um, understand uh, this giftedness that we have uh, in Christ, how we should use that in the church, our commission to go to all nations, these types of things so that we can live a life that's uh, fitting of a believer and one that pleases you, and we ask that you would set us apart this hour by the Spirit in our thinking. We be transformed by the renewing of our minds unto Christ's likeness. Uh, this is the purpose of the Christian life. It's the purpose of why we're here in this world, and we thank you that you've given revelation about past, present, and future, so we know things that have happened, things that are happening. We have a lens through which to understand the world around us, and we can see in the future by, by your word things that will transpire and how things uh, even now are preparing the way, setting the stage for those things. And all this gives us confidence and it gives us hope. Hope is not something um, that we see yet, but it's something that's unseen, but we're certain of it and acquire it by faith. Our eyes look forward and see these things as good as accomplished uh, so that we live by faith. And we thank you for these things. Um, They are precious to us. And we pray for the world around us, our lost friends, family members uh, who don't yet aren't able to see these things because uh, they've yet to believe in in the only begotten Son of God and um, been given eyes, you know, really to see these things. So we pray that we could be um, a vehicle in their lives uh, with your word, the gospels, the power of God and salvation to all who believe and uh, that they would be willing and open to hear the message and and hopefully respond positively. So, bless the teaching of your word today. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, well, uh, we're in the framework on the death of the king. So, we worked through atonement in the Old Testament, substitutionary blood atonement into the New Testament, propitiation, reconciliation, redemption. And part of that, after going through all of that, was to deal with the extent of the atonement, which is what, what we started many, many weeks ago. But Uh, in the process of dealing with the extent of the atonement, because this is such a controversial issue since the time of the Reformation, when you, after the Reformation really, when you had Arminianism, their view of the unlimited atonement, and you had Calvinism, their development of what is called limited atonement or particular redemption. 
uh, out of that, I felt it's kind of necessary to discuss both of those viewpoints and um, because they're systems and you can't just look at one part of a system and really understand why they're coming to these conclusions. You kind of have to look at the whole system. So that's what I've tried to do. And in the process of that, uh, uh, I told you a lot of things. I'm not going to repeat a lot, a lot of those things. But uh, the main thing that I want to say today is that what we've been developing is, let's just say, an alternate, or alternative way of looking at these, say, five points. For the Calvinists, these were TULIP, and that's well-known acronym, right? The T is for total depravity, the U for unconditional election, the L for limited atonement, the I for irresistible grace, and the P for perseverance of the saints. So this has all been around since the Synod of Dort around 1617 to 1619 when these points were basically developed. And they were put in a lot of the creeds that underlie the quote-unquote Reformed churches of today, Presbyterian churches, Reformed churches, some uh, Reformed Baptists and uh, other denominations that embrace these five points of Calvinism and which are enshrined basically in the Westminster Confession of Faith, which was written in 1648. So these are what I call creedal Christianity, and um, chiefly the main force today that has to be thought through and considered is Calvin, what they just call Calvinism. Whether John Calvin believed it or not, still up for debate. Uh, he was obviously dead when all these things happened, so he died long before. But um, what I developed was another acronym, <laughs> LEAVES. You know, uh, somebody put this together for me, the lady who runs our Facebook and some other things. She says, I put this up, she made a little, I don't know what you call these, but she put it together, it looks real nice. Limited depravity, election is a status, it's not something you're elect to, it's, it's a status that you acquire as a believer. Available atonement or accessible or uh, accomplished, all those work. <laughs> uh, I have yet to settle on one. Veritable grace, which we'll look at today because we've already looked at the first three in detail. Veritable grace, which is true grace, and then eternal security. So if you put the first letter of all those, you get leaves, right? <laughs> so everybody else used a flower, you know, we got tulip, there's a modern one called lotus. Uh, so all I'm left with are the leaves, but hey, you can't get a flower to bloom without the leaves, so there you go. All right, um, now uh, I, I am mainly using Calvinism as a foil because most people don't spend a lot of time thinking. There's no acronym for the Armenian view. We went through it, but there's no acronym. So most people, I'm, I'm just using Calvinism's TULIP as a foil. Now it's really easy to understand TULIP. I mean, what they basically believe. Okay, so I mean, I can say it in a few sentences. Total depravity means that you're dead, and dead to the extent you are unable and unwilling to believe. Nobody can believe. So before the foundation of the world, God unconditionally elected certain people to be saved. Those are the ones for whom Christ came and died, and those only, limited atonement. And he irresistibly, by the grace of the Spirit, regenerates those individuals before and so that they can have faith. And these individuals will certainly persevere in good works until the end of their life. And that's, that's Calvinism in a, in a nutshell. I, I don't think that people who hold the position would, would quibble too much with those things I said. They, might, they would elaborate, but I'm trying to give a summary. Hopefully they wouldn't. I don't want to misrepresent. That's not my point. But I read a lot of them. I read some more of them yesterday. Steele and Thomas, Five Points of Calvinism uh, is a whole book. So I read parts of their book yesterday. And it's all these things. Now, um, that's a really simple way of looking at things. It's, it's just saying, well, people are so dead, they can't believe, so God basically chose some people. They would be the ones who believe. But they, since they can't, God's going to regenerate them first, and then they'll have faith, and those people are going to do good works until the end of their life. I mean, it's not that complicated to understand. I just don't think that that's what the Bible teaches. Um, so we've been going through limited depravity, what that means. Basically, that means that when people are conceived, they are conceived in sin, just like Psalm 51 says. Um, and Romans 5.12, you know, we were in Adam and we sinned in Adam. So we are conceived in sin and we are born with imputed sin. And this means we're condemned. Okay. And then I made an aside about infant salvation to describe what we would have to discuss there, right? Um, but people, 
are born limited depravity, meaning they have, they, they're depraved, but they do have the capability of believing. Okay. Unless they add so much personal sin to their life, like John 5 describes, that they become unwilling and unable to believe. So people can get themselves in a situation where they're un unwilling and unable to believe, but that's a result of personal sin over the course of their life. That's basically what limited depravity means. Um, second one, election status. That means that election is not... It's not the idea that we typically hear that God selected who would believe or who would be saved or something like that. Um, this word or word group can also mean choice as in the quality that something has. You know, David had um, the mighty men who fought with him as he ran from King Saul. They were called choice warriors. Why were they called choice warriors? Well, we, that means they're the best of the best, the cream of the creme, the creme de la creme. You know, I mean, that's what choice means, right? Premier, distinguished. Even Luke 9.35, right? And other passages in the Gospels say, God says of his choice one. Speaking of the Messiah, he wasn't chosen. God didn't choose Jesus to be the Messiah. I mean, he's the Son of God from all eternity. Uh, there was no other one to choose from. He was forever going to be the Messiah. Uh, so he's the, but he is the choice one, see? He's distinguished. He's premier. And when we believe in Christ, we become choice because we are in him. That is because what do we close when we believe in Christ? His perfect righteousness, right? So when God looks upon you, he sees Christ's righteousness. Well, if Christ is the choice one, and you're clothed in his righteousness, then you are also choice in him. And the Bible repeatedly says this and connects it with justification in Romans 8. So just because you have a justified status, you're clothed in his righteousness, and you're therefore choice. It's a status. It's like me saying, are you a saint? And all God's people would say, Amen. Because the Bible teaches that all believers are, by definition, saints. You're also, there's another status word, the called. You are called, the called. Um, you've also, positionally, you've been sanctified, 1 Corinthians 1, 2. So there's a sense in which we've, we're all sanctified. You say, but I'm, I'm still growing. Yeah, but this sense of sanctif sanctification is you've been set apart by God. And that happens the moment you believe. So the moment you believe, you're a saint. Your choice, you're called, you're sanctified in a positional senses, okay? So that shouldn't be a problem with that. The Bible clearly teaches these things. Um, but he did not select before the foundation of the world it, which people he's going to save and which ones he's not. Uh, and then hold those not responsible for not believing, which doesn't make any sense. Um, and it doesn't make sense because it's, it's nonsense. Um, available atonement just means, or it could be accessible, or it could be uh, accomplished. Um, I'll probably settle on accomplished, but the main idea is that what Christ did on the, on the cross is he made an accomplished, accomplished atonement for every person so that it's available for anybody to avail themselves of freely by his grace. You know, Romans 3 is the main passage, 3, 21 through 27, which indicates that what happened when Christ died on the cross, the primary thing that happened is he satisfied God's righteousness. It's a satisfaction. The Bible's word for that is propitiation. The Father was propitiated or satisfied. And what it did is it set the Father free to justify anyone who believes, while at the same time himself remaining just. That is not compromising. He never compromises character. By justifying a sinner. Why? Because the sinner's payment has been made by Christ on the cross. And he's satisfied. The Father's satisfied. So that atonement is available for anyone who will avail themselves of it. And we avail ourselves of it by hearing the gospel and believing it. Right? Now today I want to talk about veritable grace. The counterpart to this in, uh, in the foil of, of tulip is the I. What they call irresistible grace irresistible grace. Now what they mean by that is that grace upon the elect for whom Christ died cannot be finally resisted. In other words, if a person is chosen by God from before the foundation of the world, 
they will be saved. Okay. But the question is, in this point, how is it that these people are saved? Well, the way they describe it is that the person will be regenerated by the Holy Spirit. I mean, because they'd say, well, you're dead. You can't believe. And so what has to happen? You have to be made alive by regeneration. Then you can believe. Now, this does create some weird logical issues. You're saying that I'm already regenerated and made alive before I've believed? I thought I had to believe to become alive, you know, to be regenerated. So they've got regeneration preceding faith. And they'll quote passages, you know, like John 3, 5, where Nicodemus comes to Jesus, right? And he says, what must I do to see the kingdom of God? And Jesus says, you must be born, of God, born again to see the kingdom of God, right? It's true, the Bible totally says you've got to be born of God to see the, see the kingdom, right? That's regeneration. You've got to be regenerated. So they would say, well, see, that means you've got to be regenerated first before you believe. But later in the passage, doesn't it tell us in John 3, 3, 16 how you get born of God? For God so loved the world that He gave His unique Son that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You've got to believe to get everlasting life. You can't get life through regeneration first and then, then believe. That's the opposite order. See? So it doesn't really make much sense. I mean, why would you need to believe if he already regenerated you? Aren't you already alive if he regenerated you? Aren't you born again without believing? Yeah, but nobody's ever been uh, born again without believing. Doesn't John 1, 12 and 13 say this? To as many as believed in him, he gave the right to be called children of God, even to those, I'm sorry, to as, as many as received him, he gave the right to be called children of God, even to those who believe in his name. How do you become a child of God then? By believing in him, by receiving. You, you, don't, you don't become a child of him by being born again, just like zapped by the Holy Spirit or something like that. But they've got a view that you're so dead, see, that you can't believe. Like I said, we hold to, I hold to limited depravity. A person can, they're depraved, but they can believe, given the right circumstances. I mean, you have to hear the gospel, right? I mean, people aren't just going to be saved out there who don't have the gospel. We'll talk about that today. Because the view that I'm presenting here is very, the, the, the biggest application of it all is the impetus for evangelism. The impetus for evangelism. I mean, Paul says we're ambassadors for Christ. We beg men to be reconciled to God. He says the whole world's been reconciled. Uh, God's been reconciled to the world, but the world needs to be reconciled to God, and we're ambassadors. Well, why do you need those if you have irresistible grace and the Holy Spirit's just going to zap them, and they have to be zapped first with regeneration before they can believe? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. So we'll talk a little bit about veritable grace then as something different from irresistible grace. Um, let's go through and get to that point. God desires all people to be saved. Let's go to 1 Timothy 2.4. Now, in Calvinism, that's definitely not true. He does not desire all men to be saved because if he really desired all men to be saved, they'll tell us that, well, then all people would be saved. And all people aren't saved, so therefore God only desires all types of men to be saved or all kinds of men. That's typically the explanation we're getting for a passage like this in 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. We'll say all types of men, you know, like some kings and... and, and People in authority and so forth. Those he he likes all types of people to be saved. So, some Jews and you know, like some Gentiles, but obviously he doesn't want everyone to be saved because if you desired everybody to be saved without exception, then everybody would be saved without exception. First Timothy two verse three. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, because there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for how many? All. Well, they say, well, all types, but not everybody without exception. The testimony given at the uh, appropriate time. Um, interestingly, in verse 8, Paul says, Therefore I want the men in all places to pray. Did he just mean all types of places, or did he actually mean every place? See, you can, they want to play these games like, well, all here just means all types. But I really don't think Paul's just saying, you know, uh, people in all types of places is good enough. Like some of the countries in Africa, some of the countries in Europe, 
some of the countries in Asia, some of the countries in America, or uh, states in America. Uh, no, he means everywhere, right? Like every country on earth. He wants people everywhere to be lifting up holy hands, like everybody. Uh, so I think Christ died for everybody too, um, according to these verses. And it says God desires all men to be saved there in verse 3, or 4, desires all men to be saved. I think that's all men without exception. Now, does God always get what he wants? This word, uh, thelema, uh, translated desires here. Does God always get what he wants? Well, I mean, let me ask you a question. Does God want you to sin? Does he desire? Does he thelema you to sin? Well, is God then getting what he wants right now all the time in your life? Clearly not. Clearly not. Uh, we wouldn't need to confess if he always got what he wanted out of us in our lives. That would be irrelevant. He would have wanted us to sin if God always gets what he wants. God does not always get what he wants. This, the verb here, for, which is not here, this is now, but the, the verb used over in uh, Matthew 6 in one of the famous, most famous passages of the Bible, what they call the Lord's Prayer, right? He says in that prayer, pray in this way, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's the word will or desire. Same, it's the verb form of this noun. Why would we be praying that? You know, that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven if it's already being done and God already gets what he wants. He, the, the fact is, the world is not the way God wants it. That's why Jesus Christ is coming back to set it up, right? And rule in his kingdom of perfect righteousness. Uh, he wouldn't need to do that if God always got what he wanted. See, so God can desire all men to be saved and not all men be saved. And his desire is most certainly in 1 Timothy 2, 4, that everybody without exception be saved. Okay. That's why he said his son in verse, uh, verse 5 there to uh, be a ransom, or 6, be a ransom for everybody, for all. To make everybody, let's just say, savable, so to speak. So God has, um, desires all people to be saved. And his by grace through faith salvation is available to everyone. It's available to anyone. That hears, okay, we'll get to that, but you have to hear it. Romans 5, verse 15. Look at there, Romans 5, 15. Most of this is about grace, so grace is um, unmerited favor, right? We don't deserve it. It's not based on any merit in ourselves. Can't be. Salvation is a free gift. If it's based on merit, then it's not a free gift anymore. He says, verse 15, but the free gift is not like the transgression, speaking of the free gift of justification, not like the transgression that, of Adam. For if by the transgression of the one, Adam, the many died, that's everybody who was in Adam, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. Some people say, well, see, it's just the many there. It's not everybody. Well, except that's not correct because later in the same passage he says all. And um, I've pointed out that these are being used synonymously in this passage. They refer to every person. If everybody died in Adam, the many died in Adam, verse 15, then who are the many in um, verse 15? Well, they're also everybody. Verse 17 makes the distinction because verse 17 says certain people receive the abundance of grace. Other people don't receive it. It's only those who receive it. So verse 17, for if by the transgression of the one, that's Adam, Death reigned through the one, that's through Adam, and all his descendants. Much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, which is justification, will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So there you see there's a distinction. Okay? It's those who receive right, this grace. People have to receive it, which is the same thing as believing, right? As many as received him, he gave the right to be called children of God, even those who believe in his name. Receive and believe are used as synonyms very clearly. Um, Ephesians 2.5. I, I love it that they use this verse in Calvinism. I just don't love it that they misuse it. Ephesians 2.5. See, they'll quote this and say, well, see, it says it right there. Okay. When we were dead in our transgressions, 
They'd say, see, total depravity made us alive together with Christ. See, he regenerated us. By grace, you've been saved. See, he just regenerates you. Irresistible grace. Don't forget verse 8, right? Don't, don't forget the explanation that comes later as he develops the passage. For by grace, you've been saved through what? Through faith. You're not saved independent of faith. You're not made alive independent of faith. You're saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. That is, the, the by grace salvation is not of yourselves. You don't, you're not the author of your salvation. Okay? The gift is the salvation here. Okay? Not the faith. Okay? You're saved by grace through faith. And that not of yourselves, it, that is salvation, is the gift of God. Not as a result of works. See, your salvation is not a result of works, is it? We all agree. It wasn't our works, it's Christ's work. And when we believed in Him, we had faith, then He saved us. It's an unmerited salvation because faith is not a work. Faith is not doing anything, it's receiving something. So that no one may boast. What did Paul say in 2 Corinthians 2? I boast only in Christ and am crucified. Not in me, not how great I am. Paul had to believe he believed on the Damascus Road. It's kind of a convincing experience. Not everybody gets that, but he got that amount of revelation. He responded to it. He believed. We all have to believe. There's no other way to get Christ's righteousness. So, under the right conditions, um, that is that we have the opportunity to hear the gospel. So God wants everybody to be saved. Okay, It's a by grace through faith salvation. It's, it's available. But the condition is people have to hear the gospel, right? Faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. How will they hear unless a preacher is sent, a, a preacher preaches? How will they, um, well, it's just worth it to just look, Romans 10. Don't, don't let me convince you, only be convinced by the Bible doesn't matter what I say. It only matters what the scriptures say. Romans 10, uh, 14 and 15, they, they track things back okay, to the root of, of all the things, which is somebody being sent, okay, being sent to preach. So how will they call on him who they've not believed? So first of all, you have to be a believer to call on him for deliverance in the Christian life. That's what that's talking about. I mean, first you have to be a believer before you can call on him for deliverance from your difficulties and trials in life, right? This only backs up before that. Well, well, how are they going to believe if they've never heard? Obviously, you have to hear so you can believe the gospel. <laughs> Become a believer. <laughs> Become a Christian. And how will they hear without a preacher? I mean, somebody's got to preach it, right? It could be a Gideon Bible in a hotel room, but at least they got the word, right? Uh, through the Gideons. It could be you. It could be me. It could be anybody. Missionary. doesn't matter. Somebody's got to preach, though, right? And how are they going to preach unless they're sent? See, I mean, somebody's got to be sent out there to preach. I've got to say, hey, go do this. You go out, you do it. Okay. So the point, though, is that you have to hear. Okay. There's a condition. Not everybody hears, by the way, do they? We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. These opportunities to hear the gospel. Oh, by the way, hear the gospel with understanding. That's very important. Let's not forget that point. If I spoke the gospel to you in French, and you don't speak French... You don't understand it. Now, it's the gospel in French, and it's, it's the power of God, right? But you don't know French. So you don't understand it. You don't understand what I'm saying. This is why it's so important to do what with the Bible? Translate it into other languages. You know, like Wycliffe Bible translators or whatever. So it, it, it doesn't matter. I can, preach, I can preach the gospel all day in Russian to you, but if you don't understand Russian, there's no understanding. You can't believe it. So the gospel must be heard, but it must also be understood. This opens a whole enterprise for translating the Bible. It opens a whole enterprise for evangelism and missions, doesn't it? Uh, and then, of course, believe it, as we've described. This opportunity to believe, to hear, to understand and believe, has varied sequentially in his dealings with Israel and the church, and also geographically, because not everybody has seen and heard. Um, this is probably something that bothers a lot of Christians more than anything. What about those who've never heard? What about the Hottentot in Africa? 
Now look, God set up a plan in history. It's very clear. In Genesis 1 through 11, you've just got people dealing with, God dealing with all mankind, right? Everybody spoke the same language, right? We don't know what that language was, right? But um, perhaps some proto-Hebrew or Semitic language. We don't know for sure. But he was dealing with everybody. Then in, everything changed in chapter 12 of Genesis. And he began to work with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the nation Israel. And that's most of the story of the Bible, right? Genesis 12, all the way into the Gospels. Who's on center stage? Israel. Uh, the Messiah even came to Israel. He says in Matthew 10, Do not go in the way of the Samaritans. Do not go to any Gentiles. Go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he had a very specific mention to come to, a mission to go to Israel. So most of the Bible is about Israel, probably about two-thirds of it. And Israel had a mission. It's described in Exodus 19, 5, or 4 through 6. God was going to make them a kingdom of priests. He set them at the center of the world. They've actually done studies with maps topographically and said the one place in the world that's closest to every other place is where the land of Israel is located, in what is known in the, in the ancient world as the Levant. Okay, that region that basically sits between Asia, Africa, and Europe, right? And as far as distances are concerned, evidently that place is closer to every other place than any other place is to all the other places. So it's interesting. And all the trade routes went through there, the King's Highway, the Via Maris, you know, if you were going anywhere in the ancient world and from one of those three continents to the other, you have to pass through this area that basically goes along the Mediterranean coast. It was a come and see mission. God set them in a very specific location, not for them to go out and tell the world, but for the world to come and to see. And only on very rare occasions did he say, go and tell. Example, Jonah. And Jonah said, no. I'm going to run like hell. I'm not going to go and tell. And God said, no, you're not. And uh, God convinced him otherwise. Right? And he went. The Ninevites, says they believed. They believed in the message that, in, in, in the, actually says they believed in God, Yahweh. So, um, but mainly it's a come and see mission that God gave Israel and then when he comes in the Messiah to them in the Gospels, they reject him, they crucify him. He's resurrected, he ascends, and he sends forth the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and something new begins called the church. Now, there was already transition truths in the Gospels. Because after in Matthew when he says, don't go to the Samaritans, don't go to the Gentiles, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, that's Matthew 10, 5 through 7. At the end of Matthew, Matthew 28, 19 to 21, what does he say there? Go to all nations and make disciples. Well, that's a very different message than Matthew 10. Why the different message? Well, because between 10 and 28, Israel had rejected him. So now the plan is, is changing or shifting from our point of view. And uh, God knows everything from everywhere. Nothing ever changes in his mind. But from our point of view, things change, and now he's going to build this thing called the church. Jesus even said it, Matthew 16, 18, I will build my what? Church, by the way, that means you're not going to build it. I'm not going to build it. Your marketing schemes aren't going to build it. Your money's not going to build it. These things may be used by God, but who, or, or Christ, but who is the one who builds it? Christ. Jesus said, I will do it. And, and he, guess what? He's doing it. And um, he uses us, yes. He uses our money, yes. He uses various means, but he's the one who's doing the building. Um. So now we have the church. Now, this is different because this is not a come and see mission. Israel was to be a light to all nations, but they pretty much failed. By the time you get to the Gospels, are, are they open to the Samaritans? Do they want to help a Samaritan guy on the side of the road? No. Nasty Samaritans. Dumb Gentile dogs. They don't have nothing to do with us. Okay. Obviously, they misconstrued their mission. Now, Paul figured it out. In the book of Acts, when he became a believer, he's like, oh, now he realizes Isaiah 42, 6 and 7, 42, 9, is God made Israel to be a light to all nations. And he would go to city to city throughout the Mediterranean world, right? And he, every city he'd go to, if there was a synagogue, he'd go to the synagogue first, right? Why was he doing that? 
because he was giving Israel an opportunity to join him in being a light to the Gentiles. And when they resisted and rejected and blasphemed, he would you know, kick the dust off his boots and go to the Gentiles in those places, right? And very quickly, the church became majority Gentile believers and minority Jewish believers. But this is a part of the plan of God sequentially moving. In the Old Testament, it's primarily an Israel focus, right? But it's a come and see. You've got the Queen of Sheba coming and seeing. Uh, you've got influence of Israel on other nations that surrounded them, and other people in those nations do believe. We have examples in the Old Testament. But mainly it's Jewish, right? Mainly it's Jewish. So did everybody in the Old Testament uh, period in the whole world, did they hear the gospel? What they needed to believe then? I mean, if you're honest, you have to say no. Probably not. It went out. People did hear, but probably not everybody. So we have a large question looming over there, and I realize that question is there. What about those people who didn't hear during that period? There are books about this. Uh, Steve Richardson's got one called Eternity in Their Hearts. You might be interested in reading. Um, because when missionaries did start to go out in the church age, they would go into tribes and they would find that in these tribes, they actually had folklore and songs and and stories, you know, from their, their past that had elements of truth from Genesis 1 through 11 when God was working with everybody. Interesting. They knew, I mean, that's why we have so many flood stories. There's also creation stories. Um, they're all distortions of the biblical version, but they remind us of the biblical version. You know, you see elements of truth in them. So at one point, you, you do have these remembrances in cultures. Missionaries discovered that. And they began to use that as to their advantage to try to help people get the true story, you know, recover what, what had been lost, so to speak, in translation, right? Uh, use it as a bridge to communicate the gospel to these people. So um, the opportunities have varied sequentially. That's the point. And, and now in the church, we have a different mention, uh, a mission, and that mission is to go and tell, okay? Go to all the world and tell. Um, oop, did I do the same? Okay, so the response, I did the same slide twice, sorry. The responsibility for spreading the gospel rests upon men praying. This is strange. Um, it does. Matthew 9, 37. Matthew 9.37, one of my favorite passages on this topic. Now, this is when uh, it was just going to Israel, right? But it's, I think the principle is still there, and I think the principle is valid at all times. Matthew 9.37 and 38, Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is, I mean, some of you know the verse, right? The harvest is what? Plentiful. I mean, that means a lot of people are going to respond, right? It's an agricultural metaphor. Harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. There's not a lot of people to go out and bring in the harvest, right? So therefore, what? Beseech the Lord. So this is through prayer, right? You're beseeching the Lord of the harvest to send that workers into his harvest. So it's his harvest. Okay, He's the one that's going to bring these people in, right? But there are workers who have to go out into the harvest to, to be used by him to bring them in. Well, we would say those workers are missionaries, right? Whether domestic or foreign. Um, but this is necessary. Okay? So we need to pray, right? For what? For God to send workers out into the harvest. We need more workers. We need more missionaries. Let's just put it that way. To reach more people, you need more workers, right? This is very easy. And Jesus says there's, the harvest is plentiful. If we do that, these people will come in. So doesn't that mean we have to send people to these people? To preach, sure. Israel's missions come and see. Churches go and tell. Once saved. Okay, so that's all grace, okay? God's veritable or true grace. It's available. But you see that there's, a, there's something built in there. It's available to everyone. By grace and faith in Christ, you can be saved. But again, does everybody hear that message? No. So what do we got to do? Pray. Pray what? That he'll send out workers. Workers where? Into the harvest. So people can hear. So they can believe. Right? So see how that's built in? See, see how um, Tom Constable used to, said we, used to say we were partners with God. 
Maybe some people don't like the word partners. But I think it's, I think it's basically true. We're partnering with God in His purpose. And this purpose is to take the gospel to the nation to fulfill the Great Commission. Eileen. How does that tie in? Go ahead. Yeah. How does that tie in with like Romans 1, 18 through 21, where it says, All men know God through what has been made, so that no, man's without, uh, no man has an excuse. Right? He's been clearly seen. His divine nature and eternal power have been clearly seen through what has been made. Psalm 19, same thing. The heavens declare the glory of God. The earth is handiwork. People look at nature and they know God is there. And Paul's saying in Romans 1 that what they do is they suppress that truth in unrighteousness, right? But that they know that there's a God. Well, I mean, how does that work with all this? <laughs> well, these people still have to hear, right? So if they look and they see and they know there's a God and it says that they do, then they know there's a God. The question becomes, well, do any of these people want God? This is a matter of seeking God. So this is a word study on Zeteo, which is to seek Romans 3, no one seeks God, no, not one. But Acts 17, what does Acts 17 say? God set up our boundaries and habitations that men would seek God, right? It says that, but it's a fifth class condition in the Greek, which is an optative, and it means that very few seek Him. Very few seek Him. It's, in other words, the fifth class means it's rare. It's rare that someone would. Uh, in fact, the word in Romans 3 is exiteo. It doesn't say no one seeks him. It says no one earnestly seeks him. But the word in Acts 17 just is seek. And so God has set up the, the universe to tease men into a relationship with him. This is the way I would put it. He is, Ecclesiastes 3 is dealing with the same thing. Everything has a time. There's a time for this. There's a time for that. God has set up and organized the universe in our lives to tease us into a relationship with Him. Yet you still have to hear. You still have to hear. Missionary or somebody still has to go. A Bible translation has to get to them. Something. Okay. Right? Can't be saved without it. How will they believe unless they hear? Okay. So a lot of unknowns I would just say there as far as what about people throughout history who recognized there was a God and wanted to know more about this God. And I would say, well, just because the church history book doesn't record anything about it doesn't mean that something didn't happen. And we just don't know. So, you can't say what you don't know, and I just don't know. Um, now, but salvation is by grace. You're justified by grace, Romans 3, 24. Uh, grace is the basis upon which we are justified. Faith is the means through which we are justified. They're different. I mean, you're not justified by faith. Like, faith doesn't justify you. Okay, God does that. God justifies you. He credits you with Christ's perfect righteousness. The reason He does that is because the means that He uh, set forth as the requirement that you must meet have been met. Faith. It's a channel. It's an instrument through which God justifies. The basis of which is His grace. Uh, which primarily looks at the cross and what Jesus has done. Okay? So you've got the, the basis, that's grace, justified by grace, and it's through faith, through faith. That's the way I always say it. Uh, if you need a detailed exposition of Greek prepositions, I will not bore you with that. Um, uh, because if you look them up in the lexicon, and this is just the starting point, like I looked up epi this morning, which is, Epi is a Greek preposition. It's like typically you'd say it means on or upon, but if I took you there, you'd just be overwhelmed. Like 14 different meanings. It could be a before, it could be after, it could be on, upon, it could be in, on. I mean, how it's translated. But the bottom line is from all the study over the years, it's by grace, it's through faith. One is the source or the basis, sorry, the basis, the other is the means. And that's the way the Greek works out. Um, what now? Now, grace doesn't isn't over once you believe the gospel. Now you're standing in what we call grace, a position of grace, 
and you're supposed to live by grace. Okay, you're supposed to live by grace. In this sense, grace is an enablement to live the Christian life. We'd say that enablement chiefly comes by the Spirit's work in our life. Right? I mean, how are we supposed to walk? Walk by the flesh or work, walk by the Spirit? See, we walk by the Spirit. The Spirit's been given to us as an, as an indwelling uh, presence so that we can live or walk by Him, right? And His fruit will be produced through us. So we, we now to li live by grace. So once you're saved, a believer can live by grace, can enjoy fellowship with, that's Romans 6, 14 and 15, can enjoy fellowship with God, 1 John 1, 9. We can humble ourselves and receive a greater grace, James 4, 6. So if a believer is prideful and arrogant, God will not extend grace to that believer. But if a believer humbles himself, he extends grace to that one. Okay. And as a consequence, enjoy the abundant life. What did Jesus say? I came that you may have life and that you might have it what? Abundantly. So just to have life, it means you believed in Christ, you have eternal life. You've got it as a possession. But to have the abundant life is an enjoyment. It's something after you've believed. Now you're enjoying life. Do all Christians enjoy their life? I say no. I say no. It's quite, because it's quite obvious. Um, but you can enjoy it every day if you do these things. See, you can live by grace, enjoy fellowship with God, humble yourself, receive a greater grace, and you will enjoy the abundant life. This results in gaining reward. See, rewards are separate from salvation, right? Um, they're just very different. Rewards are what you're given for how you live the Christian life. Did you live it by your flesh or did you live by the Spirit? You know, these basic questions. If you live by the Spirit, then there's a production there that is um, something that can't be destroyed because the Spirit produced it. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, self-control. Any of those things he produced through us, those have got to be eternal because they came from the eternal Spirit of God. So when you stand at the judgment seat of Christ and he evaluates your works and he sees the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness in all the situations of your life, he's going to reward you. He has to. It's a basis of divine, it's, it's based in divine justice. He, he can't do other. Um, so that's one way we can live. We can avail ourselves of the grace that he's extended to us. But there's another way we can live. This is to fall from living by grace, okay? To fall from grace, Galatians 5, 4. Uh, let's go there because a lot of people say, well, this means you can lose your salvation. No, it's just talking about not availing yourselves of grace, trying to live by law. That's all it's saying. You sever yourselves from Christ's work in your life because you decide you're going to live it on the basis of works instead of living on the basis of grace. And there's only one way to live a Christian life. It's live by grace. He says in verse 2, Galatians 5, 2, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. In other words, if you try to be sanctified by getting circumcised, you Galatians, and they were under pressure to get circumcised, he says you're abandoning Christ. He's not going to be of any benefit to you in the Christian life because you're trying to be sanctified by the works of circumcision. That's all this means. He says, I testify again to every man who receives circumcision, he's under obligation to keep the whole law. In other words, Circumcision was the introduction to the law. You get circumcised, what are you saying? You're saying, I am now putting myself under law. The law of Moses. Well, were they supposed to be under the law of Moses? No, they're supposed to be under the Spirit. Okay, The Spirit is the way to live the Christian life, not the law of Moses. So that was cutting them off from the benefits of Christ in their life. Verse 4, you have been severed from Christ. If you put yourself under the law... You're cutting yourself off from Christ because Christ isn't working through the law. Christ fulfilled the law. That, that's over. You who are seeking, there it is, to be justified before God by law. See, you've fallen from grace. See, you've fallen from the grace way of living. Okay? The way to live is verse 5, through the Spirit by faith. See, not the law. So, but a believer may put them a fall from grace in that sense, right? Which is to fall from living by grace so that Christ is no longer living through him. What did Paul say? It's right here in Galatians 2.20. It's real easy. He said it right here. I have been crucified with Christ. It's the old person that he was in Adam. And now it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. 
How is Christ's life activated in me? He says, the life which I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So he lives by faith. And that's what he's saying over in five, chapter 5. It's no different in 5.5. Five. We, through the Spirit, by faith. That's how we are supposed to live. When we live by faith, that activates the Spirit to live through us. And so it's his fruit. And he gets ready. To, he's talking about all that in a few verses later, right? Verse 16. So nothing, nothing new here. All just basic Christian truth. Okay. So, um, but if we decide we're going to go by law rather than by grace, we're going to live by law and not by grace, then Christ is no longer living through you. It's just you. It's just your flesh. And hence, you will experience the pitfalls of legalism, which he's describing here, or licentiousness, which he's also describing here, the consequent divine discipline that will come, right? Because you belong to him and he disciplines all his children. He loves us so much, he will not not discipline us. He loves you so much. That if you decide you're going to live by law and go off the deep end, guess what? He's going to discipline you. Discipline grows out of love, right? Discipline grows out of love. You don't discipline your kids, guess what? You don't love them. That's just frank. That's what God said. You don't love them. If you don't discipline them, you don't, you don't love them. You only care about yourself. So get over it and figure it out. That's all I can say. Follow God's model. He loves us so much, he's going to whoop us. He whooped Israel. He never let up. And if they decided they were going to rebel again, he just made, he laid it on worse. So what does that tell us as parents? If our kids keep rebelling, what do we do? We lay it on worse. If we want to be like our Heavenly Father, that's what we do. So this is an expression of his love. Okay, He's going to discipline you. And loss of reward. Remember, reward's eternal. So whatever you receive at the judgment seat of Christ, that's it. You'll never get any more. You'll never get any less. You always have whatever you have. Uh... Now, I don't think anybody's going to be totally upset. Um, somebody likened it to the day of graduation. You know, when you throw your hat in the air, you know, there's the valedictorian, salutatorian, and then there's you or me. <laughs> and they're happy, you know, cup of joy. But guess what? You got a cup of joy too, just a smaller cup. Well, we all got a full cup. That's the point. All got a full cup, all, all joyful. But loss of reward, yeah. And reward translates into privilege in the new heaven and new earth, the, the, new, the kingdom and the new heaven and new earth. Translates into privilege, opportunity, greater opportunity to glorify God, things like that. So these aren't selfish. Don't think of rewards as like, I got my thing. That's in this world. That's what people make a lot of money and they use it all for themselves or, or whatever. You know, people like Achan, you know, in the Old Testament and Joshua. He took all that money from Jericho and he hid it in his tent with his family's full knowledge. That's not how rewards are. They're not, to be, they're not going to be used selfishly by us. You want all the rewards you can get. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9.24, you're running a race right now. He says, run so as to what? Lose or run to win the prize? Which one? Run to win the prize, right? Run to win the prize. Why? Because the more reward you have is the more capacity potential for glorifying God in the future life to come. It's greater privilege. That's what it is. So that's true grace. It refers to how people become believers. It also refers to the grace that we live by as believers. And of course, we can fall from it and try to do it ourselves, go to the law. But the point is, no, we don't want to do that. We want to live every day by grace. That is his enablement, his strength. That strength is the Spirit of God who lives in us. So we're going to walk by the Spirit, right? When we do that, there's production, there's reward. And, and this is good. This is good for you. It's good for everybody. Last one and leaves. Okay, if we've got limited depravity. Okay. Number two, we've got election status. Number three, we've got an available or accomplished atonement. And number four, veritable grace, true grace, available for everyone who hears, understands, and believes the gospel. Then lastly, we have eternal security. This is different from perseverance from the saints. Perseverance from the saints is a doctrine that means that those who are true believers will persevere in good works until the end. That doesn't mean they won't have some, they won't slide, or backslide, or fall away. They will, they will be very careful to say that that can happen. But in the end, they'll always come back. You know, always be persevering in good works until the end. And in, in Calvinism, the five point, 
You're supposed to look at your works to evaluate whether you really are saved or not. You're supposed to make sure you have the right works. Because if you don't have the right works, then you may not really be a believer. They'd say you might just be a professing believer. Okay, And that's why Calvinism, while they claim to be theocentric and hold to the doctrines of sovereign grace, which they say that all the time, is very anthropocentric when it comes to this issue. Because you're very focused on yourself and whether you have the right works to prove that you really are saved. To prove that you're really elect. See? But they'll always back off and say, well, it's not really anthropocentric because the Holy Spirit's the one who does it through us. So they try to make it back theocentric. But, but in practice, in practice, in the real world, it's always evaluating your own works. It's very anthropocentric in this sense. So eternal security is different. It means that when a person believes the gospel, they're justified, credited with the perfect righteousness of Christ as a gift of God's grace so that you now have this new elect status or what I call choice. You are a choice in God's sight, right? Because you're in the beloved and you've been sealed by the Spirit. Let's look at Ephesians 1. We're in Galatians, so go one book to the right. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. He's already talked about the work of the Father, verses 3 through 6, the work of the Son in 7 through 12, and now he talks about the work of the Spirit in salvation in verses 13 and 14. And he says, In Him, that's in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. What do you have to do first to become a believer? You have to listen to the message. I mean, is this a surprise? I guess it is to Calvinists, because in Calvin, you're already alive. You're already regenerated before this even happened. I mean, like, what, is, what are they talking about? Um, n- nothing. Um, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, there it is, got to believe it, you were sealed in Him, that is in Christ. And here's one of those prepositions, probably translate by, by the Holy Spirit. You were sealed in Christ by the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, if you're sealed by the Holy Spirit in Christ, do you think that you can get out of that? Are you stronger than him? Are you stronger than the Spirit of God? Can you do something that is so bad that he says, I'm, not, I'm going to unseal myself. You're not going to be sealed in Christ anymore. I'm getting out of here. No, in fact, in the same book, in chapter 4, verse 30, it says that when we, uh, that when we sin, we grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, which is the day of resurrection. So he doesn't leave you. The seal doesn't go away, you, but you do grieve him. You do grieve him. But he's not going to leave you. You're sealed in Christ. This is eternal security, isn't it? You mean I can do a grotesque sin and the Holy Spirit will not leave me? He will not unseal me from Christ? Right, right. It'll grieve him. Yeah, but, and we shouldn't do it, obviously, but you're still saved. I mean, how many sins did Christ die for? Just, just the little sins that aren't... You know, this is a silly question, right? Did he just die for the little sins, what we might call little sins? We might call. No, any sin will separate us from God. Or did he also die for the bigger, bigger one? Now, there is, by the way, there's a difference. There's a difference in magnitude of sin. The Bible does teach this. It says, for example, uh, why don't you pick the log out of your own eye before you try to get the speck out of your brother's? Is a log any different from a speck of sawdust? I think so. In the Old Testament, there's seven abominable sins. Sloth, greed, murder, lust. Okay, the seven of them, right? They're not all the sins, are they? But those are the most abominable ones. So by definition, they are in magnitude worse. Okay, but they're all sinful. They're all going to separate you from God. How many of those did Christ pay for? 100% or 99.9999999% See? That's a huge difference in the end. He paid for 100%. 100%. So any sin you do, can it separate you from him? Can it make the Spirit leave you? No. See, you're eternally secure. So you can grieve him, but you never lose your salvation. John 1.12, to as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God. Are you, is he going to really kick you out of the family? No, you've been born again. You're born into his family. Once you've been born in your family in this physical world, could you get out of it? 
No, it's, it's just biological. And when you believe, it's like spiritual biology. That's the family you're in. And you're always a child. Um, even if we're faithless, he is faithful, 2 Timothy 2.13. Even if we're faithless. See, some people say, well, if, what if you lose your faith? You stop believing in Jesus. It doesn't matter. <laughs> because if we're faithless, it says he's faithful. He will not deny himself. So even if a person stops believing, guess what? They're still saved. They're still saved. You weren't saved by your faith to begin with anyway. Faith doesn't save anybody. God saves through faith. God is the Savior. Over and over, all over the Bible, God is the only one who saves. So if you lose your faith, it doesn't change the fact that the moment you believed, He credited you with perfect righteousness. That's not going to go away. And having been adopted into His family, of course, you are children and sons of God, who by His Spirit within you, he, the Spirit cries out, Abba, Father, right? Romans 8, 15, and 16. You can never be separated from the love of Christ. Other good passages for eternal security. John 10, 27 to 29. John 10, 27 to 29. See, you can lose, you can lose rewards, but you can't, you can't lose your salvation, right? Even for faithless, he's faithful. He won't deny himself. John 10, 25 to 27. Or 27 to 29, sorry. Speaking of a sheep is those who believe. He says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, they follow me. I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. They will what perish? Never. Is that kind of definitive? That's very definitive. Never is, means never. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Who? No one. Can you snatch yourself out of his hand? Can Satan snatch you out of his hand? No, no one. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So not only are you in his hand, Christ's hand, you're in the Father's hand, and no one can snatch you out of either one of those hands. Is that eternal security? That's quite secure. That's, that's very secure. Romans 8. Romans 8, and we'll finish with this one, right? Yeah. Romans 8, 33 to 39. Well, let's start in 31. What? 31, what then shall we say to these things? The things he just talked about, the great chain of redemption, that we're basically secure. He says, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's, I would say, choice ones there, right? That's you. That's me. If you believe, you're a choice one. Who's going to bring a charge against you? God is the one who justifies. See, he's declared you righteous. And that's it. I mean, there's no higher court. Who is the one who's going to condemn you? See, there's no one above God. God's greater than everyone. Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather the one who was raised. He lives, see, he's at the right hand of God who also intercedes for us. He intercedes for believers, right? He's constantly interceding for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Who's going to do this? Who's going to cause us to lose this salvation that we have? Who's going to do that? Will tribulation, you know, difficult times, distress, persecution, famine, Nakedness, COVID, blah, 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 uh, peril, you know, wars, it's the sword. And, and see, nothing, nothing like this. Just, he says, just as it's written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered a sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, in all these situations in life, he means, famine, difficulty, distress, wars, and so forth. He says, in all these situations in life, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present now, nor things to come in the future, nor powers, whatever they may be, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. That's called a catch-all, right? And just in case Paul's saying, just in case I missed something here that you think that you could slip in here that would cause us to be separated from the love of Christ, let me make sure and say, nor any create, other created thing. 
Are you a created thing? Yeah. So can you separate yourself from the love of Christ? No. No. <laughs> Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you have eternal security? Yes. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean we ought to go sinning? Don't be dumb. If you're in his family and he's a good father, what's he going to do if you go sin? Spank. Discipline. Why? Because he hates us? No, because he loves us. And he doesn't want us to ruin our lives. It's very simple. So, Eternal security is the last point and leaves, okay? So then, um, what, what shall we say to these things? Well, I think that what we say to these things is that if you look at this whole concept as a whole, the whole thing, you realize the people are limited in their depravity, but that that means that while they're condemned, they can believe. But they need to hear it, Right? They need to hear the gospel message. They need to understand it so they can believe it. Believe what? Believe that this atonement that Christ provided for them on the cross, right? That it's complete. That the Father will justify anyone who believes. He'll save you. And when they believe, they become elect in their status. They become choice in God's sight. Like a special people. I mean, are we not a special people in this world that God has called out and set apart? from the world. We're not the world. We're separate from the world. We belong to him. We're choice. We're premier. We're distinguished in his sight. Why? Because we're so great? No. But because we're clothed in the one who is great. We're clothed in his perfect righteousness. It is still hard for people to believe this because they say, I, but I'm a sinner. I sin. How can, how can he say I'm choice and perfect and righteous? and as white as snow. Because it is a legal declaration. It is legal. God is very concerned about the legal status of all humanity. Either you're in Adam and condemned, or you're in Christ, and you are righteous in His sight. It's a legal status. And you have thereby received His veritable grace, which is available for everyone, right? And when you have received it, you, of course, are eternally secure. You know, if anything, this should make you want to tell people <laughs> about this so great salvation, that there is no other name under heaven by which men may be saved than the name Christ Jesus, Acts 4.12, right? Um, now, not everybody's going to receive it, but as many as do, they, he gives the right to become children of God. It, it's not a reflection on you if people don't respond to the gospel when you give it to them. It's a reflection on them. You, you don't have to worry. Paul says, hey, it's, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for all, all who believe. It's the gospel's work. I almost wanted to do a whole series after this on the power of the word um, because I discovered some re pretty remarkable things. So let me just take you to one. Isaiah 55. Um, Isaiah 55, and in fact, we're about to get to Psalm 119 in our weekly readings, and that psalm is over 100 verses, basically on the Word of God. But look, look at this in Isaiah 55. Oop, I should probably start turning there so we can get finished up. The atonement is great, and it's, it's there, and it's accomplished. But it doesn't automatically save people. See, it, it never says the atonement is the power of God into salvation. It always says the gospel is the power of God into salvation, right? See, the Calvinist wants to say, well, it automatically saves people. The cross automatically saves. No, it's the word of God that's powerful to save. Look at Isaiah 55 and verse 8. My thoughts are not your thoughts. That's humbling, right? He's not thinking like you're thinking. He's not a projection of your thoughts. Nor are your ways my ways. In other words, the way he accomplishes things is not the way we accomplish things. We have cause and effect down here. We know how things work down here, but that's not how he does things, so get over it. Right? You're not, my, my seminary president used to say this, you're not going to figure God out. You, you can't. He, you can never have a comprehensive knowledge of him. You can have only partial knowledge. 
His, the way he does, does things is not like us. He says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts higher than your thoughts, see? As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, they don't return there without watering the earth and making it bear and sprout. And we're watching that happen right now, right? And furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater. See, God is, does all this. And you're like, how does all this work? So will my word be, which goes forth from my mouth. What is his instrument for causing things to happen? His word. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent. In other words, he has a purpose for his word when it goes forth. And guess what? You and I are a part of this because he said, I want you to go to all the nations and preach. Preach what? Your word? No, this word. It doesn't matter your eloquence, your ability. That's not where the power is. The power is in the message that comes from the God who is all-powerful. It will succeed, he says, in the matter for which I sent it. You will go out with joy. You will be led forth with peace. See, this is how you find fulfillment in life is what he's saying. You let the word of God do its work through you. That's the only way you'll ever find significance. The rest is just a charade. It's the word. That is what Paul is summarizing in Romans 1. He says, the gospel is the power of God and salvation. Paul didn't think he was powerful. He was just a messenger, see? And I think that's what leaves, points us to the importance of us doing. Calvinism just says, you're either elect or not. And if you are, you'll just irresistibly be regenerated. Does that even remotely sound like the Bible? Does that even remotely stimulate evangelism? No. But this does. And I think even if it's not perfectly biblical, it's closer than Calvinism's tulip. So let's go forth from this place as we walk around our neighborhoods and our town and we see the leaves. We're reminded of these truths. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the revelation of Scripture. We pray that we would be dedicated to the Word of God because it's the power. We need your word hidden in our heart, as the psalmist said, that we may not sin against you. It's the word of God understood in our heart that pushes out the sin that we habitually struggle with in our lives. And that's, that's why we're here, to hear the word, to hear the word, to intake, to bring it in so that it prevails and helps us to overcome the difficulties of this world, as well as give this word to other people. And we ask that people would respond. You'd put people on our path that are ready to respond to the gospel and that we would not be afraid. As Paul said, not ashamed of the gospel uh, because it's the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. In Christ's name, amen. stand and join us singing Rejoice, the Lord is King. to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.
leave that there. Huh? I got it on.